can you make a homeless application if you're sofa surfing? It might seem like a really simple question. You might think that people who are sofa surfing are definitely going to be homeless, and many of them will be, but it's not automatic. And actually, you'd be surprised how grey an area it actually is within the law. So the Homeless Code of Guidance, for example, the rule book that councils have to use, is unhelpfully vague about this kind of issue and doesn't really kind of state some things which really would be helpful if it had done. So in this video, I'm not gonna just talk about, you know, can you make a homeless application? Because the easier answer is yes, you can. But the much more relevant question is, are you legally homeless? And therefore, can you actually get assistance from a council if you're sofa surfing? And where is that line between, you know, kind of really sort of like obvious sofa surfing through to staying with friends and family members in the long term? And, you know, kind of where, at what point are you actually homeless? So in order to try and explain this, I guess we'll just start with the obvious ones. So sofa surfing, I guess, is a term which is in common parlance. You see it in the media a lot, see it kind of discussed a lot. And people do recognise that it's, you know, maybe the second most obvious type of homelessness. So when I do the training online, the first, you know, when, when asked what kinds of homelessness are there, the first answer is often rough sleeping. The second answer is almost always uh, sofa surfing. So we get that people who are sofa surfing are homeless, but the problem you then get is people approaching councils and then getting either told they're not homeless or um, get given a, a not homeless decision, a section 184 not homeless decision. And the question is, okay, how do you actually challenge that if the council's wrong? And the council usually will be wrong because they don't, uh, they're not very good at getting it right. Let's just say it like that. So the obvious kind of uh, situation where you're sofa surfing are where people who are literally, you know, they've, they've got no kind of continuity where they're living. They're just literally going from place to place, you know, different friends, different associates, potentially even strangers in some points. And just by nature of that, they're going to be putting themselves at a pretty high risk of harm, um, particularly since, you know, many, many adults who end up doing that are kind of at risk. And, and when I talk about adults, for, for young people, you know, anyone over the age of 16, and below technically but but housing law really only applies to, to over 16 year olds it's also going to be a really big issue so i remember one of the guys i've known longest in homes and services in bedford i've known him nearly 20 years now he spent about 10 years sofa surfing and staying in night shelters that sort of thing he never actually slept rough which i was really surprised about because i've known him for so long and just thought you know he must have rough slept at some point but but no he kind of was always, always able to get by he's a really likable guy had a lot of friends so he was able to do that but Clearly, you know, it had a, a negative impact on him in the long run in terms of his stability and, and just mental health because sometimes it really was kind of, you know, kind of very tight as to whether he'd get anywhere to live at all. So that's obvious. And I guess a situation which is the other end of the spectrum where you've got an 18 year old living with their parents. Now, this is where it starts getting a bit technical. You're homeless if you have nowhere with a legal right to occupy. That's kind of obvious, you know, so people who are rough sleeping are obviously going to be homeless. But the question of whether it's, you know, whether you've got a license to occupy accommodation is not, is not often set out in writing. You know, when you're 18 years old, you turn 18 or you turn 16, your parents don't generally kind of make a contract with you saying, you know, you can stay here. The idea is that it's just implicit. It's an implicit license to stay there because essentially, you know, that's that's pretty obvious by default. Your, your parents are happy with you being there. The problem with licenses in this situation is there's no kind of security of tenure. So your parents could literally just kind of have, a, have an argument with you and kick you out and say, never come back here. And there's no protection from, from eviction in that sense. So in that situation, you would be homeless. So that's the kind of kind of the, the, the bandwidth we're talking about here. And I guess this idea of whether you've got accommodation with a legal right to occupy breaks down into a couple of more intricate issues. And so this is it might seem like a, a tangent, but the idea of accommodation within the law is kind of, you know, there's been some really unpleasant cases about it, in my opinion. So the idea back in the 80s, there were these kind of cases where someone was staying in a beach chalet or kind of, you know, really obviously not not proper accommodation but they were seen to have accommodation. And out of that came this idea of, you know, you, you have, you're, you're homeless if you don't have accommodation, which is reasonable to continue to occupy. And so with things like refuges, actually, um, technically refuges are now considered to be accommodation, but you're still homeless whilst you're in a refuge because it's only supposed to be short term. It's not reasonable to continue to uh, occupy indefinitely. And that's kind of a key thing. So when we talk about you're homeless if you have nowhere which is reasonable to continue to occupy, it is for the foreseeable future or, or indefinitely. Those are the kind of two words that you see within case law, or two terms you, you see within case law. And that goes to a case back in 2018, the Supreme Court case, uh, Samuels v Birmingham, which is an amazing case. Essentially what had happened was this, this single mum had left her accommodation because she simply couldn't afford the rent. 
Birmingham said, you know, you know, you're intentionally homeless, you chose to do that, it's your own fault. But the Supreme Court said she was homeless because it was not reasonable to continue to occupy indefinitely. And, and yes, she could have stayed there for, you know, a little bit longer. But because it wasn't that kind of settled sort of situation, she was legally homeless. And I guess that's quite helpful to look at whether someone is homeless who might appear to be sofa surfing, kind of on that continuum between being very obvious and actually kind of being quite insecure. One of the first complaints I ever got upheld uh, was part of the complaint was that this guy was homeless, he was obviously in priority need. The council rang up his sister and said, if you don't put him up for the night, he's going to be on the streets, which was a lie. The council had a duty to house him. But the sister basically, you know, obviously kind of took the housing officer out of word and continued to house him. And, and the relationship very quickly broke down. He had a broken leg at the time. He was sleeping on the sofa. Clearly, it was not reasonable to continue to occupy indefinitely. The council should have housed him at that point. So legally, it's quite clear, you know, the, the interim accommodation duty kicks in if there is reason to believe that you might be homeless, might be eligible, might have a priority need. And I guess we're talking here about the idea of you might be homeless. So if you go to a council and say, I'm sofa surfing, can you help me out? That's almost certainly going to be reason to believe that you might be homeless. So that would trigger section 184 and section 188 potentially if there's reason to believe that you might be eligible and in priority need as well. So that kind of gets you, gets your 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 shoot, you know, your foot in the door, so to speak, of the process, which often is maybe the big biggest battle. What should then happen is the council should make inquiries to your friends or your family members and basically say, you know, have you actually kicked them out yet? And actually, is it reasonable to continue to occupy this property? Because the family member not, might not have kicked them out yet, but if it's yeah, if it's not a combination for whatever reason that's, that's reasonable to continue to occupy, then you would be homeless. So, as I say, a guy with a broken leg sleeping on a sofa in, in his kind of sister's little flat or whatever, that was not reasonable to continue to occupy. They should the council should have offered temporary accommodation immediately at that point, or interim accommodation technically. However, this is this is where it kind of gets a bit more nuanced and kind of, you know, there is room for manoeuvre here because you can say, you know, that, that guy could have said, you know what, I'm actually happy staying with my sister in the short term. You know, it's better than temporary accommodation as far as I can tell. You know, she can support me with a broken leg or whatever. So there might be re good reasons why he'd say, actually, do you know what, I, I hear that you've got a duty to offer me a to interim accommodation, but I'd rather just lay it off for the time being. And that should be fine. There's another Birmingham case, Edwards v Birmingham, which basically showed that, Council should in that situation say, yep, yeah, we have a duty to provide interim accommodation. You've chosen in the short term to stay with your sister in this case, but if that relationship should break down, please come back to us and we have this duty to provide interim accommodation. So you're gonna have this kind of gray area as well where people are happier sleeping in their, you know, kind of friends or family members' home for the time being, but it's just not gonna be in you know suitable in the medium and long term. So in one sense they can still be, you know, their homeless application can still be processed during that period. And ultimately the decision should be that they are homeless and therefore, you know, the council's other duties would apply if, if the other criteria are met. So if we go back to the Code of Guidance, if you look at 6.12 to 6.16 of the Code of Guidance, so it's in the chapter obviously about the definition of homelessness, you'll notice it's quite vague, but they do give some examples. So one of the first examples they actually give, or the first example they actually give, is where you've got a situation where let's say you've got parents, you know, they've got an adult child who's got a learning difficulty or, or a disability or something. The parents are looking after that child. They, you know, have the absolute, they've got the child's best interest at heart. Um, and yet they're just really struggling, you know, really it isn't, it isn't working out for them, it's kind of leading to tensions, it's leading to them to, to not be able to kind of cope. The Code of Guidance says in that situation, council should be very sensitive to that situation in general because in that situation, the parents might be very re reluctant to actually tell the person to leave, tell their child to leave, unless there's accommodation to go into. So they're kind of in this catch-22. Unless they actually kick them out, the council duty won't kick in. But as I say, the Code of Guidance is saying council should be kind of really careful in considering that. And this kind of brings us on to this question of, do you need a letter from your friend or family member saying that you've left? And the answer is legally, no, you shouldn't. It's the council's job to make inquiries. However, as you can probably tell, I don't mind arguing with the council, but this is probably not one of the things I would argue about if I didn't absolutely have to. If you can get a letter from your friend or family member, um, then do so because it's just going to make it more straightforward. So essentially all the letter we need to say is, I don't want Mike staying here anymore, or whatever it would be, words to that effect, or I, I can only put Mike up for another two days. And I would say if you're going to do that, keep the time frame short. Because the council can legitimately ring up the family member and say, look, you know, is there any way we can kind of resolve this? 
in the case where you've got an adult child with disabilities, is there other support we could put in place to kind of make that arrangement more sustainable? So there are things that council can do where you've got kind of maybe younger people who are you know having a kind of maybe a volatile relationship with their parents. There is scope for councils to kind of look to do mediation around that. But again, another thing the code of, guidance, uh, code of guidance does say is that they need to be very careful when considering situations which might be uh, abusive, which is quite common. You know, domestic abuse is quite often intertwined with these sorts of situations, and just kind of and, and where it would put just a really um, a difficult strain on that family relationship in general. So those things, there is some clarity about those things. But other than that, you kind of there are going to be situations where you're staying with a family member, and actually, it's still not reasonable to continue to occupy. The family member might be happy for you to be there, but it's still not reasonable in the long term. And pragmatically, it seems that the council's general practice tends to mean that it's it's kind of almost necessary to kind of get a letter from them saying that you're being you're, you know being kicked out. Um, so that's kind of yeah, just I guess something which can kind of help in that situation, but but again, shouldn't really be necessary. So yeah, I'm hoping I kind of covered the main basis there around um, sofa surfing. As I say, when you're sofa surfing, sometimes it's going to be obvious and sometimes they won't, you won't need to have an argument with the council at all because it will be blatantly obvious that you're staying at lots of different people's houses or whatever. And councillors, again, should be very kind of wary of situations where you might be you know, at risk of exploitation or other abuse because that can often go hand in hand with that. You know, you've kind of got various kind of exchanges going on where you've got those types of arrangements. I remember when I worked at the night shelter in Bedford, there was a 16-year-old girl who would essentially be exploited in, in order to get uh, somewhere to stay for the night and, and councillors should be really kind of hot on picking up on those situations and being supportive um, which in that case they weren't but anyway so yeah so that's kind of something yeah hopefully that kind of gives you a bit of clarity I mean going back to that obvious question can you make a homeless application the answer is yes you can always apply to a council for help and I've done videos about the best way to do that which is essentially in writing and if you give the council reasons to believe that you might be homeless and you've asked them for help with housing, then that triggers the homeless application. That's the legal threshold. Councils often say nonsense like, oh, you know, come back in two weeks and we'll, we'll take a homeless application from you. But when you send that initial email, you ask the council for help with housing and you give them reasons to believe that you might be homeless, That's the, the homeless application has actually legally happened at that point. And then it's down to the council to probably you know, kind of get more informa information from yourself. It might be about getting information from, from your family or friends or whatever. Uh, there was an infamous case, and I can't remember which council it was now, where a young person who'd been abused by their parents went to the council, and by the way, there's no reason to think that she wasn't, um, but basically the council officer said to her, we need a letter from your parents just to prove that they're abusing you. And that, you know, it kind of it got a little bit of attention in the press and so on because it was just that ridiculous. But those sorts of things do happen in this process, and that's kind of why understanding your rights around when you can make homeless applications is probably really good to really kind of good to hang on to because as always I would highly recommend you never talk to the council on the phone or in person if you can help it try and do everything in an email there will come a time where you will need to have a kind of an in-depth assessment but in those initial stages you want to make sure that you've made it obvious you have made that homeless application that you are sofa surfing so yeah so I think that's that's kind of um, hopefully a little bit of help uh, around this if you've got questions about this as always put them into the comments anonymously so ask them as what if questions what if someone was sofa surfing uh, what would be the implications of you know this this particular situation rather than just saying I'm sofa surfing what do I need to do because I don't want you to have to put personal data on the internet to get sensible answers you shouldn't have to and you don't have to um, just ask it as a what if question I'll prioritize those questions I'll answer those first in the live stream and then if people do ask questions in in the first person or about their own situation I'll basically do them at the end I appreciate that it might sound like I'm in difficult but for me I just want people to 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 kind of enjoy their right to a private life and right to data protection that they have. It's a really good bit of law. And as always, I guess I've got to do the YouTube thing every so often. If you do find this stuff useful, do subscribe, do give it a like, do share it around if you want, because I'm hoping this information may make a difference to quite a few people. We're getting some really good feedback at the moment on the channel in terms of bits of information we've given out about the particular situations and how that person's been helped. I actually had a person message me last week saying that they'd actually got three different complaint uh, compensation payouts through different ombudsmen and she sent me the, the kind of the the actual decision so it's just really good to see that actually a little bit of information on the channel hopefully can make a big difference in people's situations.